Okay, well, I guess, hi. <laughs> if more people come, then they'll come. But if not, then I guess we'll just record this for the sake of having something to show for it. But this is a visual storytelling workshop, which is teaches you how to tell stories visually. You guys know who I am. You guys know who Mac is. So I guess we can move on from the introduction. Um, so there are three main parts to the workshop today. And it's like the three S's of filmmaking, which I'll explain composition and creating a mood. And if you don't know what that means, that's fine because we'll get into it. So three S's of filmmaking. You know, those little Russian dolls where everything goes into another thing. That's kind of what this is. Uh, sequence is made up of scenes and a scene is made up of shots. So a shot is basically raw camera footage from the moment that you call action until the moment that you say cut. Um, it's all in one take. And a scene is made up of several shots together. That's a very convoluted way of just saying it creates this experience that's set in one particular place in one particular time. And if there is a change in time and or place, then usually you have a different scene. But obviously this varies from director to director and filmmaker to filmmaker. So sometimes a scene, like you'll be able to tell when a scene is done based on whether the point that was first introduced has been resolved or whether a new point has been raised and you've moved on to something else. And a sequence is basically just a bunch of scenes put together. Basically a movie is a sequence, uh, a short story, a short film is a sequence. And the process of telling a story through a uh, sequence through assembling scenes is called scenic method. And it, that's like pretty important to filmmaking. Okay, example, I don't know if you'll be able to hear the audio. I think I take out my headphones, but this little clip from The Godfather will start out with a shot of Michael, which is Al Pacino's character talking and we'll move on to a different shot. And I'll like pause and kind of point that out so you guys can see, oh, wait, yeah, that's, that's a different shot, so. Let me take that. Oh, okay, apparently I can't take out my thing because shit doesn't work. So <laughs> maybe you won't be able to hear it. Let me know. Can you hear that? Can you hear that? Okay, so that moment where we go from looking at Al Pacino to looking at that other dude, that's two different shots because the camera has moved and it stopped recording and there was another camera recording. So that's different footage. And that's how you can pretty much tell the difference. And then a sequence is just the entire Godfather movie, which is fantastic. And if you haven't seen it, you should watch it. because Danny, so can I ask a question? No. Okay. so. <laughs> What if, like, instead of having that first shot where it's like looking at Al Pacino and then the other guy, what if you just like swivel the camera? Does that still count as one shot or is it two? That is still one shot because you didn't cut. So okay. basically, the entire thing that was recorded at one particular time, that is a shot. Okay, thanks. All right, composition. Composition basically means how things are arranged visually in a shot. So from the camera angle to the blocking of the actors to the thing, the thing, a thing, an object, anything that's in the shot, the way that it's arranged, that's composition. Um, a pretty good rule of thumb, if you're not sure how to arrange your subject is a rule of thirds. And it's basically this three by three grid, you can see in the little picture there. Um, that you can put your subjects along the lines or, oh yeah, hi Donna, along the lines or at the intersections or between the lines. And the human eye naturally looks for information um, along the lines of the rule of thirds. That's just kind of how the brain works. So if you put your subject along them or within them, that makes it more aesthetically pleasing and also more easily visually digestible. So it's always a pretty good rule of thumb to use. Then another term that's pretty important is mise-en-scene, which literally means like placed 
in the scene. Um, and it basically refers to everything that you see on screen, lighting, costumes, colors, actors, set, everything that you see is part of Nissan Sen. You could make the argument that some sound is part of it as well, but only if it's diegetic, which means that it's coming from the world of the story. So if a character is listening to the radio and you can hear the music, then that sound is diegetic and then it would be part of the misansen because it is within the world of the story. And okay, next types of shots. This is a little bit, um, this is a lot, but bear with me because it is pretty important. Okay, so there are different ways of describing the shots um, of what you see. You can see this little like thing on the left, this little graphic that kind of describes how the film, how the shots get from very tight onto like a particular body part, which would be an extreme close up, then to a close up, which would typically be the face or like a bigger part of an object. It's a little bit hard to describe, but you can generally use your judgment and kind of figure out, okay, is this a close up or is it an extreme close up? A medium shot is generally like anywhere above the waist and you can see the head of the person um, or like maybe around half of an object, hard to describe with objects. A full shot is just, you see the entire person and a wide shot is you see the entire person and you see the background. Um, I, guess, I hope that's not confusing. If anyone has like questions, please feel free to interrupt me. Um, then another important thing is the angle of the camera. So a high angle may, basically means the camera is placed above the subject and it's looking down on them. So there's this example from Harry Potter where the camera is looking down at Harry. And that generally gives this sense that the subject is in a vulnerable position, as you can clearly see Harry is here. And then a low angle is looking, the camera is placed below the subject and it's looking up at them. So it, this can generally give the sense of like power and whatever subject you're watching. Of course, this varies. Um, you can use different camera angles and different shots to convey different things. It honestly just depends on what you're trying to convey. It depends on the story, but that's a general generalization, general use of it. Okay, so some more types of shots. I'll try to get through these quickly because I don't have images for them, but a two shot is basically when you have two people in the shot, pretty self-explanatory. A short shot reverse shot is when you have, that's pretty common in actual conversations like in, in film, when you have a shot of a person talking and then you have the reverse of the other person that they're talking to. So a shot reverse shot kind of shows you what someone is looking at and then the thing that they're looking at, if that made any sense. Hi. <laughs> Um, an over the shoulder, you don't have to do that. <laughs> an over the shoulder shot is basically when you can see from behind someone, like part of their shoulder and their head, and you see what they're looking at. So if I were facing the other way, this would be an over the shoulder shot of me, of the wall, basically. Um, an establishing shot is basically a shot that helps you situate your viewer um, on where the location is and kind of who the people are in the shot. So it's typically a wide shot or an extreme wide shot. Um, and yeah, it also varies, which is like, yeah, it varies. But if, if a shot kind of shows you like, say you see a coffee shop and then you see the inside of a coffee shop, two characters sitting on a table, that shot of the coffee shop would be the establishing shot because it, it shows you where the characters are. Then a tracking shot is basically when the camera is moving along following a subject generally, um, but not necessarily just the camera is physically moving. Whereas a pan is when the camera is in one place, but it is like shifting from left to right. And if it's shifting from top to bottom, that's called a tilt, not a pan. Should have added that there. Um, and lastly, a crane shot is typically an overhead shot. So it's like, looking down like a high angle, looking down on the subject. And it basically means the camera is physically on a crane. Now we have, um, what are they called? The thing, drones that can basically have the same effect, but 
yeah, they were called crane shots back in the day because we didn't have that technology. Okay, creating a mood. This is my favorite part, so I'm excited for this. Um, a few things, you know, cover depth of field, color theory, lighting, costume set design. Yeah, you can see that, you know. So depth of field basically refers to what is in focus in the shot. So in the example at the top, you can see that most of the things in the foreground and the background are blurry, but the very like first half of that cat or whatever that is, is in focus. So there is a very small range in which things are in focus and that's called a shallow depth of field. And in the bottom example, pretty much everything except for this little part um, at the very foreground is in focus. Um, and that's called a large depth of field because there is a pretty big range of things that are focused. Color theory, yay, okay. So I'm not gonna go through every single thing, but I will afterwards, but basically the most important things from this, primary colors, red, yellow, blue, secondary colors, green, orange, purple, tertiary colors are like combinations. So yellow, green, um, orange, red, orange, blue, green, that kind of stuff. Those are tertiary. Um, also a hue refers to the color itself. And when something is desaturated, it means that gray has been added to it. So it is less vibrant. Those are, yeah, C some color theory for you. All right, so some color schemes that are pretty popular in film. Monochromatic, pretty obvious. Everything is the same color. This is one from the matrix. Everything is green. It usually creates this harmonious, like visually harmonious effect and this like lulling, like soothing effect. And here, this kind of mirrors the way that people are asleep in the matrix. Spoiler alert, if you haven't seen the matrix. <laughs> um, then analogous color scheme is when the colors are next to each other um, on the color wheel. So here we have yellow, orange, green. Those colors are all next to each other in the color wheel. It also creates harmony and is visually soothing, but it adds a little bit more dimension to the shot. Then we have complementary color scheme, which is probably the most used color scheme in film. That might be a bold statement to make, but I'm fairly certain that is true. Um, you see a lot of like orange and blues in movies. And those two are directly opposite from each other in the color wheel. That's basically what a complementary color scheme is. And it kind of creates tension and conflict because the two colors are directly opposite. So they clash in a way and you have the warm tone versus the cool tone. So it creates that visual tension that usually mirrors the tension that's going on in the narrative. And then you have triadic color scheme. Um, which is when the colors are evenly spread out across the color wheel. And it's pretty rare. They don't, they don't usually use this in um, live action movies. They're more popular in like cartoons and like animated movies. But yeah, it's bas it basically creates this like sense of vibrancy, which is why it's pretty common in cartoons because they're like fun and fantastical. Yeah. Okay, and last, split complimentary would have been more useful if I had had like a little color wheel on here, but it basically complementary color scheme is when two colors are directly opposite from each other. Now picture that one of those colors, instead of using that, you're using the two colors that are next to it. So they're the ones that are like sandwiching it. So for example, here we have yellow. Yellow is directly opposite from purple, but here it's using the magenta and the blue, which are next to the purple, um, instead of using the blue, which would be the complementary. So it's still high contrast and it still creates tension, but not as much, it's a little more balanced. Okay, discordant colors basically are just colors that are not part of the color scheme. And it's usually the film's way of saying, hey, pay attention to me. Whatever is happening here is important. This, that's why I don't belong and it draws your eye to it. And then transitional colors, that basically means that the color palette changes throughout a film or throughout a series. So for example, in Breaking Bad, you start out with these really 
vibrant colors, but as Walter becomes more and more corrupted, the color palette becomes more desaturated. So you kind of get that mirroring of what's going on in the narrative in a visual way. Okay, I'm not gonna go through every color because we would be here forever, but what I kind of wanna get across from this is that color associations vary by country, by culture, by region of the world. So yes, you can use color associations, but you cannot expect them to be universal. And it is important to note that certain colors mean certain things in different cultures. Um, that's mainly relevant if you're trying to do a film about a culture that's not your own, and you're, you know, thinking of colors as a way to convey like something in the narrative, it's important to keep that in mind. But yeah, I feel like we all pretty much know what colors are associated with what, but this will also be in the PowerPoint and we'll send it afterwards so you'll have access to it. Okay, lighting. Um, not that much, I'm not saying that much about it. There's a lot that could be said about it. But the main things that I wanna cover is high key versus low key lighting and cool tone versus warm tone. So high key, okay, when you film, there's this general setup of lights that you use. You have a key light that is in front of the subject, but not directly in front, like a little bit to the side. You have a backlight that is behind the subject and you have a fill light which is also in front of the subject, but on the other side of the key light. The key light is the main source of light um, in the shot. So when you say that something is high key, it means that the key light is very bright. So there aren't many shadows and there isn't a lot of contrast. So high key basically means low contrast. And then low key is the opposite. So the key light is low, and you have a lot of shadows, and you have a lot of contrast. So high, low, low, high. Um, and typically low key lighting is used to kind of convey sort of darkness um, in a character or in a narrative, whereas high key lighting is more like ethereal, more like good, I guess you could say. There's like associations with light and dark that can also be applied to lighting. And then cool tone and warm tone, we all pretty much know, but cool tones like blues, greens, purples, they kind of mirror that effect of the temperature. So if you use a lot of blues, like in the Revenant, then you get this sense of that it's cold, basically. And if you use a lot of warm tones, like oranges and reds and yellows, then you get that sense that it's warm or hot in the case of Mad Max. Yeah, and you can pretty much use this, like it is a pretty um basic, like rudimentary kind of guideline to follow, but you can get really creative with how you use lighting. And costume and set design. Um, basically, costume and set kind of helps locate the viewer both temporally, so in terms of like when the film is, is taking place, and physically or geographically. So if you look at the 1917 little still, you see that the characters are wearing uniforms. So you think, oh, they're soldiers. If you know history, you're like, oh yeah, okay, you know which war it is. And you see the background, the explosions, okay, you know where you are, you know this is war, you know the characters are soldiers, and you kind of know what's going on. And then in the Grand Budapest Hotel example, it looks very fantastical. The You can tell that they're in an elevator because there's that little thingy, I don't know what it's called, but it controls the elevator. Um, if you look at how the characters are dressed, you see, oh, okay, they're wearing uniforms kind of, so they work at a hotel. And if you look specifically at the protagonist, the guy wearing the lobby boy hat, you can even tell by the way that the hat is lopsided that he doesn't quite fit in in this world, that there's something special and different about him. And even from something as simple as how you place a hat, you can convey something about the character or the world that they're in. Okay, so let's give it a shot. Um, I will. I have two stills from two very different movies and just take a look at it and kind of tell me, okay, what, what do you think? What does it make you think? What, what do you think about it? So this is from Princess Mononoke, um, good movie. And feel free to take a look at it and yeah, just, take a stab at it. There are no wrong answers here. <laughs> I 
anyone can talk. It's okay. Yes. Okay, so Kaylee saying in the chat um, that the trees frame the princess so you know that you should look at her and her face is fierce in all caps along with the wolf guy and they're looking the same way. Yeah, so the eye line kind of lets you know that they're not alone here, that there is someone else in this world basically. Yeah, pretty much the, the framing of the trees is pretty important here and it kind of lets you know, okay, this is who I need to be looking at and something important is about to happen with these people. Um, I also quite like the red accents on her face and her mask slash headpiece um, because it contrasts directly with the green of the nature. So you kind of get this like sense that there's some tension in there, um, which I mean, there is, if you've seen the movie, there is quite a bit of tension, but <laughs> okay. And then there's this still from the Blade Runner, also a fantastic movie, very different from Princess Mononoke, but yeah. Give it a look and just take a stab. What what jumps out at you? What do you notice? It can be about literally anything. Shallow depth of field. Yeah, there is a very shallow depth of field. So you, that kind of lets you know that Harrison Ford's facial expressions here are what's important. So you get the sense that there is this like important process going on in his head and whatever decision he's about to make is the most important thing in the shot. Kaylee's saying they're looking at the same, oh wait, no, that was a one. Dark and light contrast, intensity. Yeah, there's a lot of high contrast, there's a lot of shadows and like a bit of light. Um, so there's also a bit of darkness in this world. And something I also noticed is the blue in the background and there's a bit of orange on the left and there's a little like thing above the gun that's also orange and his face is orange. So you have those like complementary colors directly opposite from each other that visually create tension, which reflects the tension that's going on narratively. So yeah, very good. Thank you guys. Any Questions, concerns, comments, any, anything. Danny, what is your favorite color? Green, but you already know that because it's also your favorite color. Um, Maya, what's your favorite movie? I was like ready to say my favorite color. <laughs> you can answer that too. Favorite color is yellow, which I feel like it's controversial because apparently people associate it with insanity in the West, which I didn't. But oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, I didn't know that either, but that's what the slide said. <laughs> but yeah, yellow. And Christina, I don't know. Do you have a favorite movie? Um, I can't really think of one right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's fine. Um, Mac, do you have a favorite movie <laughs> or color? Yeah, uh, favorite color is red. Favorite movie is Princess Mononoke. Hey! Oh. Were you the one that put that in the PowerPoint? Uh, I suggested it, but Danny is responsible for uh, implementing it. Is that your favorite Studio Ghibli movie? Oh, yeah. Nice. I'll... I haven't seen that one yet. I've only seen Howl's Moving Castle and Spirited Away. Yeah, it um, blows both of those movies out of the water. So. Really? Okay. Then I guess I'll have to watch it tonight. That's then. a controversial <laughs> take. Most people do not agree with it, but it's also correct. So. Okay. All right. Okay. So Get off your high horse, Mac. Kaylee, what's your favorite movie? Ooh. Oh, I don't know. Um, right? Probably something by Wes Anderson. I fucking knew it. I I'm knew sorry. You were <laughs> Sorry, I'm predictable. Um, which one of his exactly? I don't know. Maybe Moonrise Kingdom or Grand Budapest Hotel. Hard to pick. But I've been like binging his films during quarantine. So. Isn't he about to have a new one? 
Yes. Okay. So he's supposed to have French Dispatch. It was supposed Timothy to come out Chalamet's July. In it. Yes, they shot. Yeah, Timothy Chalamet is in it. It's shot somewhere in like Eastern Europe, and it's supposed to come out in July. But then they couldn't do that, so they moved it to October. But then they couldn't do that either. And now it's just like indefinite, and we don't know when they're going to release it. But he's already starting to film his next one. So mm. I don't know. I'm just I'm very disappointed that they haven't. Yeah. But I mean, I get it. But yeah. <sighs> Yeah, it's like frustrating that it's like made and it's like done. Yeah, it's like there, but we just can't see it. Mm. Yeah, tough. This is a great PowerPoint. Thank you, Danny and Mac. Um, this is very interesting. Sorry, I was kind of in and out of it for a while, but it's very interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Oh my God. Thank you for coming, Rumi. <laughs> Much love. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's it. Um, oh yeah, so there will be another workshop next week on Wednesday um, at 4 p.m. I believe, post-production slash editing. So if you're interested in that, we will have that information on their social media soon. And we also have a movie screening uh, for Latinx Heritage Month. Hell yeah, we're watching Beatriz at dinner. Um, haven't seen that movie, but Salma Hayek is in it, so I'm very excited for it. And that'll be on the 11th at 4. So if you're interested in that definitely come. Uh, we already have a Discord link. This isn't updated, but that will also be in our social media. So yay. And sources, my brain, and for the images, how to use color in film. Yeah, thank you. Well, thanks for coming.